welcome to New Jersey Politics with Laura Jones. I'm Laura Jones. Today on the show, we're discussing cannabis in New Jersey. While it's legal, we've not yet seen retail cannabis shops pop open in our state. Standing by is longtime councilman and current mayor of Somerville, Mayor Dennis Sullivan. We're going to be talking about why his town voted to bring in cannabis businesses and what roadblocks they're facing to seeing the first cannabis store open up. Now, we're also talking about New Jersey's state budget and Governor Murphy's budget address with Bill Glasgow, Senior Director of Public Finance at the Volcker Alliance, a nonprofit organization. Their goal is ensuring government is accountable and delivers with excellence. Now, before working there, Glasgow was managing editor at Bloomberg News and senior editor at Business Week magazine. First, though, New Jersey saw its own version of the trucker convoy, like we saw in Canada a few weeks ago. Organizers of the New Jersey convoy moved big rids from North to South Jersey and was all about vaccination freedom. Joining us now is one of the organizers of the North Jersey Freedom Convoy, Shalomita Cooperstein. Shalomita, we thank you so much for joining us on New Jersey Politics. So let's talk a little bit about the convoy. What is the goal? You're heading from North Jersey to South Jersey. What's the goal? The goal this weekend is to bring everybody out in solidarity and to bring unity into the state of New Jersey and to show the United States that we are finally coming together as a state, as we the people, to show the government that we are standing together now and that we are tired of all of these tyrannical orders that are coming through and all of the mandates, they need to start going away. The pandemic is over. You, you came from the Ukraine. So you know what it's like to live right next to the Soviet Union. So can you tell, share a little bit about, share a little bit of your story with us and what you saw when you lived there and what you're seeing now and the parallels that you, that you see. So my grandparents actually um, grew up during the Holocaust times. They were little kids and they were Jews that were in the Holocaust. So in the Ukraine, the Soviet Union, they came in and they took over the Ukraine. So I was born in the Ukraine and then my parents fled to the US when I was six months old, but I grew up knowing that I was Russian. My passport said that I was Russian and I spoke Russian. It wasn't until like a few years ago that I was well into my adulthood that I knew and understood that I was actually born in the Ukraine, but the Soviet Union came in and they took over the Ukraine. So what we're watching happening right now is exactly what happened when, you know, my family members were younger and I was just you know, born into a communist country that they were trying to flee from because they had no freedom of religion. There was no freedom of speech. They couldn't even smile in photos because if you smiled in a photo and the government got hold of that and they thought that you were happy and that they would assume that you had money and they would come in and they would take all of your things. I mean, that's the reality of how my family grew up. A lot of people in the U.S. are saying, you know, there's, there's no way we would let that happen. Um, and then no one could foresee a pandemic coming, right? So the pandemic happened. So we, of course, let, you know, willingly, you know what? Yeah, you know what? Govern let the government ha overstep its bounds. Um, and some of the things aren't necessarily rolling back. Um, but, you know, we, we thought, well, okay, well, we get it. We're, we're trying to protect people. But can you talk a little bit about what you see uh, what, what, from your perspective, what, what you see? Uh, because, you know, you have this convoy uh, going back to New Jersey of truckers coming from the north to the south. And again, it, it's more than about just about a mask mandate or about vaccines. You, you have a much bigger picture that you're trying to get people to say, open your eyes and look what I see. Yeah, I mean, listen, what people need to understand is that Nazi Germany didn't happen overnight. There was a time that people actually loved Hitler. He was a very respected leader in, in the early 1930s. And then something changed and something took a turn. So I've been saying this for years because I've been in the medical freedom movement long before COVID ever came around. I happen to have a vaccine injured child. So I believe that everybody needs to have a choice and everybody needs to have informed consent. I was not given informed consent letting me know that this is a possibility that this is gonna happen to my child if he takes a vaccine that the CDC is telling me that I should go take. 
So I've been watching this for a really long time. And when New Jersey was trying to take away religious exemption, which is the only way a child is allowed to attend public schools without vaccination is to have a religious exemption. And when New Jersey was trying to take that away, I was screaming from the rooftops that this is the way it started in Nazi Germany. They take away your right to religion, which is what we saw in COVID when they shut down the churches, they shut down the temples, but they didn't shut down Walmart or the liquor store. Right. So they took away our right to freedom, uh, freedom of religion. And then what we're seeing now with censorship on Facebook, they're taking away our freedom of speech. So one by one, they're taking away the freedoms that our forefathers put in place for us for a reason. My family and millions of other immigrants, they came here for freedom because that was taken away in the country that they were in. And this is the only place that has preserved that over all these years. You mentioned that your, your child has a vaccine injury. I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that. H have you faced repercussions for speaking out? Some people uh, don't want to speak out. Some people are afraid to speak out or, or to say things. So, you know, you, you have a very bold message. What have people been saying back to you? Yeah, I mean, I, I've been in this a long time, so I, I've heard all the things. I've heard that I'm a conspiracy theorist. I heard that I'm a crazy mom. I've heard that, you know, I mean, you name it, I've heard it. I, I was a licensed acupuncturist for 10 plus years. I had a practice in New Jersey. So everything I do, I do holistically. You know, so people call me granola. They call me a crunchy mom. I mean, they, they have all kinds of names for me. But in the end, the bottom line is my family is so healthy and happy and thriving through all of this. And, you know, my family has been essential all through COVID, me being in the medical field and my fiance is in the food business. And so things were very different here. We've been out in the world since day one. We, we never quarantined. We never wore masks. We never abided by what they were saying and doing because anybody that was in the medical freedom movement knew that something was going to come that was going to mandate vaccines. This is the message that I was screaming two years ago before this ever even started. Right. So with this convoy going from North Jersey to South Jersey, uh, what, what has been the response so far, so far? And what do you think, what are you hoping uh, the government will do as a result? The response so far has actually been really great. It, it's really beautiful to see how New Jersey comes together. I, I've done this several times in the state with tragedies that have happened in the past. And it's amazing to see how people step up in their leadership and what they are good at to come together for the well being of the state. What we are hoping for is that everybody picks a overpass or a side of the road on one of the roads that we're planning on coming down, bring your American flags, make a sign for the trucker, show your patriotism. This weekend is all about patriotism. We celebrate things like 4th of July, Memorial Day, Labor Day, where we put on our flags for the weekend and we barbecue. But the foundation of this country is based on the men and women that have fought for our freedom. We are at war. People really need to understand we are at war. Just because bombs are not going off here right now, this is the start. We are in 1935 Germany, before the concentration camps, before they were gas cham chambering people. This is how it started. People started ratting on their neighbors. People started turning their neighbors in. People were silent. If you are silent, you are a part of the problem because you're watching as your fellow neighbors, your fellow brothers and sisters are being taken. I mean, what happened in Canada is crazy. These, this was peaceful protesting. People were operating their, their rights as sovereign human beings to go out and have their messages be heard, to have their bank accounts frozen. I mean, this is why we cannot go to a cash less society. It's really important for people to wake up and understand if they put us all digital in a split second, your whole life's work can be wiped out. So we really need to pay attention and open up our eyes to what's happening in these other countries, because with the leadership that we have here right now, it's coming. So, so passionate and also uh, the, the relevance of what your family saw um, and, and experienced themselves. And we thank you for taking the time to share this with us today. Thank you so much.
My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Bill Glasgow is a senior director of state fiscal policy at the Volkler Alliance, a nonprofit foundation. Bill, welcome. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks. Well, let's talk a little bit about New Jersey's fiscal health and really as it relates to the past and also in comparison to some of our neighboring states. Give that perspective. Well, New, New Jersey is in robust fiscal health, uh, which is quite a turnaround. Uh, Jersey, like many states, don't, don't, doesn't do well in recessions, but uh, we've had a very strong economic recovery, 3.8% um, jobless rate na nationwide. Uh, and this is partly because of all the money that the federal government pumped into the economy, uh, the ability of people to work from home, uh, not, just, uh, not just tech and finance workers, but a lot of teachers worked from home for a long time. So all this has contributed to revenues coming in way over target, $4 billion over target. Uh, so right now, New Jersey is in very strong shape. I think this can be confusing to some people if they're reading a headline looking that, you know, the state is flush. The state has got extra money coming out and they're also looking at what they're spending and saying, but yet I've got so little to spend. So, you know, how, how do you, how can you help, how, how do you rectify that, so to speak? If the state's got money, why do I have so little in my pocket? Well, I think on, on balance, uh, consumers are doing pretty darn well. Um, there's, there's, New Jersey has a lot of millionaires and some billionaires uh, and, a, and a big poor population, but employment growth is very strong. The minimum wage, uh, you know, there are minimum wage jobs, but the some of the traditional minimum wage jobs that the employers have to offer a lot more because uh, because workers are in short supply. So I think that it's it's a recovery that's really 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 very affecting everybody very widely. Uh, and some of the things that the governor is proposing, uh, especially the, uh, the extra rebate on, on, on property taxes for homes, that averages about $626 per head, I, I think, if, if you're earning uh, under $250,000 a year. So that's going to help put some money in people's pockets too. We still have to worry about tomorrow. Uh, uh, but right now, things are pretty good. Well, can we talk a little bit about that? If, if people are certainly going to be happy to see six, seven hundred dollar check coming back, uh, but can the state and will this be the next portion of, of after the governor proposes the legislature disposes? Uh, will there be any uh, negotiating as far as well? Instead of giving people a check back, why don't we lower our taxes? Well, that, that that's a very good point. Um, some state taxes did fall in the past couple of years. One big tax, uh, which is contributing to New Jersey's uh, robust revenues, was the millionaire's tax that, uh, that passed, or the extra millionaire's tax. But gasoline taxes, believe it or not, went down last fall. You may not be seeing it right now with, uh, with where gas is at, at the pumps because of, of Ukraine. Uh, but taxes, taxes did fall. Uh, the governor said, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to uh, raise taxes. Uh, and remember, a lot, of our, a lot of our taxes in New Jersey are property taxes that the state doesn't control. These are local taxes for towns, schools, and counties. Uh, the, the state income tax is devoted to local property tax relief, but those tax rates are set at the local level, not at the state level. All right, so when the governor laid out his spending plan in the budget address, it's the first one of his second term, what's kind of the takeaway about what his priorities are? What is this telling you? I, I think there's some interesting points. One is that uh, the state has been making extra contributions to the pension system. New Jersey has about $140 billion debt for, for pension benefits that legislators and governors from both parties promised, but didn't really fund. So we have a long-term debt in New Jersey, uh, and some of this extra cash is going is going into funding pensions. Uh, another another thing we 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 see is that a lot of the the money, the six billion dollars the state received from the federal government from the uh, from the ARPA Act, 
the budget relief, a lot of that is going to infrastructure, education, not into propping up continuing programs. All right. Um, in New Jersey, they've implemented uh, quite a few measures uh, post-COVID. Um, have they done enough to make sure that they have uh, strengthened the state's fiscal foundation? Well, I, I think that, that the, the state has done quite a bit to, uh, to build a base. Uh, Moody's Investor Service just upgraded the state for the first time in 17 years, which is, which is noteworthy. Uh, but if, uh, if the Federal Reserve's current policy of raising interest rates leads us into recession, uh, that cushion could vanish pretty quickly. Uh, New Jersey still has a lot of structural debts. The budget depends on a, on a deal cut with the New Jersey Turnpike Authority to put uh, $7 billion of Turnpike money into the budget. That's a big, big uh, subsidy over 10 years. We're counting on the Turnpike to help build the Gateway Project. So uh, there's, 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 there's still some uh, bailing wire and, and, and string and tape holding things together. Let's just hope that we don't hit another recession. You know, when the governor announced uh, the extended property tax relief for two million New Jerseyans, uh, giving that uh, average homeowner about six, seven hundred dollars back, yeah, that 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 does seem to be the big headline. How likely do you think that is? How likely do you think that is to be a reality? Well, I I think that some version of this will will make it through. Uh, there's a lot of support for this in the legislature. That's really where this uh, this movement was coming from. So the, the governor is uh, the governor is riding the wind, if you will. So I, I think I, I think it's likely we'll see that. Uh, what didn't work particularly well was what happened under the Christie administration, which was to try and cap property taxes. That that was a modest success, but there were a lot of there were a lot of of exit ramps in that. And it, it, it really didn't. Uh, we like our services in New Jersey. We have over 600 towns. I don't know how many, how many hundred school districts. All this costs money. And until we focus on, on some of the fundamentals, it's hard, to, it's hard to keep property taxes in check. Right. And, and that's the thing about New Jersey. New Jersey is a home rule state. As much as people would like to have their property taxes lowered, I, 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 former, House, uh, former Assembly Speaker Jack Collins used to say, People don't want, and I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but he would allude to, you know, people don't really want lower property taxes. And it's not that they wanted to pay more, but it was because they like their local school. They like knowing the name of their police chief. They like knowing the fire company. You know, they don't want to give that up. And do you think that that will really ever change in New Jersey? It, it's very difficult. It took the Princetons over 60 years of efforts to, to merge. Believe it or not, six, 60 years of tries. Uh, so stuff like this moves really slowly. What's moving faster is regionalizing services. So uh, my town, my town shares a whole bunch of services, including 911 dispatch with its neighbors. That's one way of cutting costs and keeping and keeping local at the same time. Uh, the state perhaps could provide more incentives to, to do that. But you're right. It's, it's very difficult to break down those barriers. Well, we thank you so much for taking the time to talk a little uh, dollars and cents and a little bit about New Jersey's budget with us today. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We're turning now to an initiative that a lot of people hope will bring in tax dollars for the state and local towns, cannabis. Joining us now is the Somerville Mayor, Dennis Sullivan. Mayor, it's so good to see you. Good morning. Good. So listen, some towns, they have voted to restrict cannabis sales, but your town, one of many, has approved bringing in cannabis business. So why is this? And tell us a little bit of the value that you see. Sure. Well, first of all, as you know, there are six different classifications of licenses that towns were asked to look at in terms of opting in or opting out. And uh, Somerville uh, Borough Council last year, after uh, a great deal of study and deliberation, decided to craft an ordinance that allows up to two retail establishments, so class five. Um, that was our first task was was to decide which of the which of the six options uh, would would best you know suit our community. Then we had to look at locations for um, you know to actually operate those establishments. 
And uh, what we did is we looked at our zoning map and uh, as you probably know, Somerville is only two square miles. Um, we have 12,000 people. So, you know, we have a lot of density, uh, but, but in terms of actual geography, we're, you know, we're very limited in terms of, of the space that we have. 99% of our town is, is probably developed with uh, either nonprofit or, or for-profit establishments. So there wasn't a lot of land available. Uh, what we decided to do was restrict the uh, establishments to the B5 highway zone, uh, which would include uh, sections of Route 22 and sections of Route 206. Main Street in Somerville is also uh, State Highway 28, but we decided to exclude that uh, portion of the highway from the cannabis sales. We have a very active, vibrant uh, uh, commercial uh, retail restaurant and service downtown. And we felt that the cannabis establishment uh, would not be a, a good complement to that. Plus there's really, uh, we're fortunate to have very few storefronts available. We did see it as a benefit and simply, not simply from a revenue uh, you know, generating standpoint, which of course is on everybody's mind. That, an article in the local paper today about you know property tax relief. So uh, that's always an issue, but it was not it was not the driving issue, even though we can charge up to two percent on retail sales uh, to generate revenue for the borough. That was uh, was was it was mentioned, but it was not a driving force be, behind our decision. We had a, an approximately seventy percent approval rate from the public on the public question that came up, and when we had our series of public hearings. We had a, um, a good number of, of uh, individuals who, who currently are in the medical marijuana uh, um, phase of, of, uh, you know, of consumerism. And they spoke you know, at, in advocacy of this. Some of them do travel at, at quite a distance. So we felt that, uh, you know, although, they, although the revenue is always on our minds, uh, yeah. and, you know, by, be naive to say it's not a consideration, but was not the driving you know, force behind our decision. We felt that uh, you know, the time had come to represent the, you know, the voice of the community that went to the polls and voted. And they voted uh, you know, pretty much statewide in overwhelming support. And in our particular community, it was a, it was a, large, you know, a, a, a large turnout in favor. And we felt that if we crafted an ordinance that was restrictive, responsive at the same time, we could come up with a good compromise. And I think we have. So what is your timeline? When, when do you think you will see this? You, two properties? Our ordinance is in place. Uh, we have a um, very substantial application that the council has approved. It includes um, um, a $2,000 application fee, which is non-refundable. Uh, it includes a $10,000 per year license fee, if and when the license is granted. Um, the licenses, of course, will be restricted to no more than two. They cannot be held by a single individual. They have to be held by separate entities. The person has to undergo a background check. They have to talk about local impact, hiring procedures, uh, and most importantly, the security measures they're going to take to make sure that their operation is, is safe and secure. So there's a, you know, there's a formal application that uh, the, the applicant will have to you know, file. It'll be reviewed by the borough council. But right now we're in a holding pattern because um, the, the cannabis commission, you know, from Trenton is really the 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 driving force right, you know, behind this because any any licenses that are, that are granted, uh, although they're approved at, at a local level, uh, they, they really are um, generated by and supervised by you know by the state regulatory agency. But clocks ticking in Trenton. They were talking about February, then they were talking about March. So I, I would hope that once the, you know, the, the regulations are, are established by the commission in Trenton, there are serious individuals that feel they, they want to pursue this. They will come and, and fill out the application, pay the necessary fee, and then we'll start the review process. I have a committee in place, which consists of myself, my administrator and two councilmen, but we have not, uh, other than developing the application, we have not had to meet on any review process yet, but I, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that, um, you know, we've given a lot of thought to this. Um, uh, it took us a while to develop the application. We met it by our legal department, uh, conferred with the attorney general's office to make sure that you know, our our application process meets all the, you know, the stipulations of the state. And I would hope that, you know, 
once the you know the state regulations and the playing field is established, that if there are serious individuals, there's a lot of preliminary work that's going to have to be done by the cannabis industry and and interested applicants before they you know before they come and and and, and you know put put their money where their mouth is and begin the review process. But I'm I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll have you know uh, some responsible interest. Uh, it, it's it's new for all of us. And I'm sure we're going to learn as we go along, but I feel that we've we've done a lot in in the last year to make sure that once uh, once the uh, the do's and don'ts are released, uh, we'll be ready to respond. You know, in, in a in a reasonably you know concise and, and timely fashion. Just one final question: Are there any stores in New Jersey open right now, or is there a certain model that you're looking to to kind of get advice as you move? I know there are medical facilities. But I'm I'm not I'm not in a position to answer that right now. In terms of retail, I don't believe there are because I, I think the, uh, the like I said before, the driving force is the is the state regulatory commission. So as as far as uh, just a walk up you know kind of a facility, I I would doubt it. But again, I, I I'm not in a position to answer that. I just know that we are you know we have applications, mm -hmm. and if and when someone is is has fulfilled everything that they need to do with the state of New Jersey. They can give us a call, come in, and, and you know we'll we'll take uh, we'll take time to review their application, and if we get a responsible bidder, we can you know we can proceed. But it's um, you know this, this is a learning curve for everybody. Hopefully optimistic, but uh, I'm, I'm not ready to cut any ribbons yet. Okay. Well, Dennis Sullivan, when when you are, I'm sure that uh, we would love to have you back on. Uh, Mayor Somerville, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you very much. I'm Laura Jones. Thanks so much for watching New Jersey Politics. We'll see you next time.